Okay, so we will let the room fill here for a minute, Renee. Okay. I was trying to think about how long you've been working with Wacom. It must be close to eight years because I've been here for seven. Yeah. Well, I have been using Wacom for 20 years now. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> but I've been working with you guys for eight years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was your first Wacom product? Uh, so it was the, the little tiny uh, clear plastic. It wasn't a bamboo back then. It was something else. And it was like a super tiny little square with a big sheet of plastic around it. And it was not quite like a brick, but you could probably. <laughs> was it the graphire? Is that yeah. possible? Graphire. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> we do graphire have a few. Or graphite. Yeah. Yeah. We do have a few of those kind of lingering around the office here and there. Amazing. Relics of the past. <laughs> yeah. They all still work. You can plug them in. Um, it's always just a matter of the drivers, but um, yeah. they do still work. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, no, I, I still have, I don't have the graphire anymore, um, but I still have like tablets that are 10 years old and they still work. <laughs> They're still at home. <laughs> I have them it's, like backup just in case I break a tablet. <laughs> you have backup and backup and more backup. Yeah, I had a I had a tablet break once uh, when I was overseas in Scotland, and I had the the cable plugged into the bottom of the Intuos, and it fell and it snapped the soldering like the soldering on the inside, and I was like, oh my god, I have so much work to do, and I don't have a tablet, so I went to like the closest town was four hours away, and bought just like the smallest tablet that I could like the only tablet I could find, um, and that one still works. <laughs> so. It was a good investment. Yeah, no, exactly. But ever since then, I'm super paranoid. So I keep like all my extra tablets just in case like an earthquake and a fire and a lightning strike happen all at the same time and they lose all of them except one. Well, <laughs> you never know. It's feeling close to that here on the West Coast. Yeah, I feel bad for all you guys. That's insane. Well, here we are talking about happier stuff. Um, <laughs> We have a nice full room for you, Renee, and all of these people are here to learn how to make a person float. Mm -hmm. And when we talked about doing this webinar, we talked about it being very much a Photoshop 101 and yep. that we would kind of disguise it in this how to make a person float. So in addition to learning how to make, make your model float, um, you will also learn some Photoshop basics here in this next hour. I am Melissa Ashcraft. I'm the host here today. I'm on the Wacom community team. Um, Wacom, we've been around for 35 years making digital pens. And as Renee mentioned, they last a really long time. <laughs> they do. They last a very long time. <laughs> So we do have a couple of rules. Um, the first is that this will last about an hour um, and Renee is going to take questions throughout. So if you do have a question, please use the Q&A feature in chat. And if you're on Facebook, you can leave a comment and your, your questions will be fed right in. Um, and then I will ask the questions. Renee, I will ask you questions as you're going so yeah. we can get to all of them, hopefully. And then this is being recorded and we will email everybody a YouTube link once, uh, once this is finished. We do have a couple of offers for everybody. We have uh, at our friends at B&H, which is a fantastic photo photographer haven. Um, we have $100 off Intuos Pro Medium with an Adobe Creative Cloud photo plan. And then $50 off the Wacom One, which is the product that Renee is going to use today. And then for our Canadian friends, Renee is from Canada, um, Viztech is the place to go to purchase your Wacom products. All right, without further ado, Renee, take the screen share and show us some Photoshop. <laughs> All right, let's see how this goes. Share screen. This will stop the other screen, screen sharing, yes. I take control, boink, share, okay. So first things first, that was another image that if we have time, I'll show you a couple more tricks. But what I want to show you guys is how to take an image from this here to this-ish. <laughs> so if you're first getting into Photoshop, 
Photoshop is a huge and super complicated and very uh, intimidating program. So I totally understand you opened it and you're just like, what do I do with this? There's so many buttons, there's so many everything. Uh, and everyone wants to learn how to do cool stuff in Photoshop because otherwise why would we open up the program? So the easiest way if you're first getting into compositing is to do somebody floating. Uh, it's super fun, super easy. When I first got into Photoshop uh, 20 some years ago, it was Photoshop 7, not CS7, but Photoshop 7. Uh, this was like the, some of the first stuff that I did with it because I was like, oh my God, there's this thing called masking and that means that I can make someone float and that's really cool. So if you're first getting into it, this is an easy, non-intimidating way to get into the program uh, and still make something cool. So uh, first things first, I'm just gonna go here. So this is, this is my raw file. So what we did was we went out uh, into a park and like all shooting on location goes for me. I don't know if you've experienced this yet, but if you photograph on location, you're gonna have your wish list of what you want and then the complete opposite is what you're gonna get. We were really hoping for cloudy skies and like not too much wind or rain. And we didn't have any rain, but we had like 80 kilometer an hour winds <laughs> and super bright blue sky and tons of mosquitoes. So uh, unfortunately we had to hide in the trees. So I didn't get the shot that I wanted, but I want to show you guys this because you can take this with your iPhone. So it doesn't, doesn't matter. You don't need like a crazy setup or anything to make this happen. Uh, so what we did was we have this drum stool that we have her laying on. So that's just to get the pose right for her to look relaxed. Because if you want somebody floating, they're supposed to feel effortless, right? They do, there's like gravity isn't applying to them, which is one of the great things about a lot of classic art is that gravity isn't really a thing. And that's what makes these things feel so ethereal. So what I have to do is I have to put my camera on a tripod or put your phone on a tripod and lock it in place and lock the focus. So I got her into the position I wanted her to be in. Then I had two friends throwing this amazing dress uh, that uh, Lewis Mayhem just made for us, which was bananas. She was just like, oh, you want something like for the long train? And I was like, yeah, that'd be great. What do you have? And then she just made this, which is crazy. So anyways, so I had Isabel uh, lay on this uh, drum stool because it's soft, right? If you're going to have somebody laying on something, you want them to be comfortable. So the drum stool worked pretty good. It got her high enough without being too high. And then we made sure she was on stable ground so she doesn't fall off. Uh, so once we got the pose that we liked with her here, then I took a photograph with nothing in it. So there's nothing here because what I want to do is I want to be able to erase this stool. And you could go in and clone stamp it out, but it's way too much work. So this is, this is a much easier way to make things happen. Um, I thought I would just check in with you, Melissa, and see if there's any questions before I go to the next step. Not yet. People are giving shout outs um, to where they're from, and there are a ton of Canadians here. Yes, Canada <laughs> represent. <laughs> we are the North. Oh, Renee, there is a question just popped up. Yeah, what's up? How have you experienced the development from the program Photoshop itself? Um, basically, this is from Michelle the differences between the older versions and the newest one. Right. So the biggest difference is teaching yourself Photoshop on Photoshop 7 is completely different than teaching yourself Photoshop on Photoshop 2018 or 2019 or tw what year is it? 2020? God. <laughs> um, if I was really new to this program, I would have a really hard time teaching myself this program. So when I first got into Photoshop, YouTube wasn't a thing. There wasn't really any educational resources anywhere. Um, to help me learn this program, especially, I mean, the internet was terrible also. Uh, so imagine doing like dial up, trying to learn Photoshop videos. Um, so it's way more advanced than what it used to be. However, a lot of the stuff is still the same. I mean, brush tools are still the same. They're just getting better. Masking tools are still the same. They're just getting better. Um, I mean, they have like a whole 3D and video side to Photoshop that I don't even pay attention to that have been there well, 3D has been in Photoshop since the early days. It was there when I was using 7. Um, so it's just getting bigger and more complicated, but it's also still very useful. I mean, there's a reason why it's still the flagship program if you're getting into photo manipulation and I mean, a million other things. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question for you, but it's still good. It's just way bigger <laughs> than, it needed, than it used to be. You have another question, and this actually is also a question I was having. So this is from Jay Lee. Can you use wires to achieve the same effect on the train? I think the, that they're referring to the dress here. 
Uh, yeah, you, you can use wires, but the thing with wires is that the fabric is still going to sag. Uh, so it's a lot easier if you have someone who can throw the material. So you want to have a material that is light, uh, that moves quite nicely, especially for floating shots. So uh, chiffon is a great material that has great uh, weight in the air, like it moves very softly. Same with tulle. Uh, those kinds of materials, even lace in this case here, um, it catches the wind really nicely and it falls in a very graceful pattern. So wires, you're going to get these like points. Um, I mean, it's kind of like if I hold up my hair, right? You're going to have these like points as opposed to if you just throw it, right? So if you throw it, then you get like a natural, natural movement. Wires are going to create this unnatural look. So yeah, having more friends on board is super helpful. All right, one more quick one, and then okay. you're going to keep going. Yeah. <laughs> um, any recommendations? Mark is asking. He watches Flern, Kelby, and Creative Live. Any other recommendations? Uh, I mean, there's so many. <laughs> there's so many. I mean, there is uh, Pro Edu, which I've got two tutorials on there. There is uh, Super Ice Education has now got a ton of different instructors on their platform. Um, let me see here, who else is there? I mean, there's just so many, like everyone is getting into education these days, especially with COVID, a lot of us are at home. And so we're just doing them online now. <laughs> um, but I mean, those are some of the big ones. Uh, I'm sure there's some overseas that I'm not aware of that are fabulous. There's probably some coming out of Asia that are wonderful as well. Uh, it just depends you know, of course, what your native language is and what you're comfortable with. Uh, and say the one again that you have two webinars on. Oh, I have, um, I have two full tutorials on it's proedu.com. Proedu.com. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they're my studio compositing ones. They don't, they don't cover floating. Um, they're definitely a little more advanced. I basically took all the stuff that was in my brain that was really weird that I never got to talk about and I put it into a tutorial. So. <laughs> cool. All right. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Carry yeah, no worries. on. Okay, so we're gonna get rid of this stool. So the first thing I wanna do is, like we photographed this on a tripod, so we have a blank slate, which is this guy, oops, wrong direction, right name. This guy here, where there's nothing in it, and then where our subject is. So we're gonna copy and paste this over top. So copy paste is pretty easy. You're gonna go Control A or Command A if you are a Mac user, which is gonna select all. And then you're gonna go over here and go Control Shift V or Command Shift V. So that's V as in Victor. And so what I wanna do now is layer masking. So I'm gonna show you just a quick way to explain layer masking. And so just uh, follow me along here. So I'm gonna go to this background layer here, paint that blue, and paint this black. So what layer masking is, is it's kind of like putting icing on a cake, All right? So you have your, your cake color. In this case, our cake is blue. And we are gonna put black icing on it because I guess that's just what we're gonna work with today. <laughs> so we have blue cake with black icing. And all of a sudden we realize, well, we don't want the black icing over the entire cake. We wanna see some of the cake underneath it. So to do that, we're just gonna to go to this little circle with a square in it. I call it the little flag of Japan. Um, <laughs> and I'm just gonna to go to my brush tool, which on your keyboard is the letter B. And at 100% opacity and 100% flow, I can see all of a sudden the blue that's underneath. So we're scraping away the black and putting the blue, and so that the blue underneath shows up. And you're like, Renee, why would I use this when I have the eraser tool? Well, because the eraser tool doesn't mean that I can put icing back on. So masking works in a gray scale. So we have black and white here on our brush panel. And if we alt and click on our layer mask, you can see exactly what the mask looks like. And this is, comes in handy later when we're masking more complicated stuff. So alt click again and we see everything. If I paint black on black, or sorry, we have a white mask. So if we paint white on white, we're not gonna see a thing. Black, we're gonna start seeing the cake underneath. And then if we paint white again, it's just gonna start covering up we're basically putting more icing on. So that's basically the basics of layer masking. It's just putting one thing on top of the other and then scraping away the parts where we don't want it 
or putting the parts back on where we do. So with the eraser tool, there's no like, whoops, I screwed up. Uh, with masking, there is. So you can go back and change your mind a whole bunch. So first things first that I want to do is one thing just before I do the masking. And this is something that you're going to run into when you do floating people, because oftentimes, especially in this case, she's laying on something and the stool itself is actually changing the shape of her body. Now, if you're ever feeling lonely and nobody notices your work or like you're not feeling noticed, put a before and after of a liquefied job because the internet will eat you alive for it. But first thing here is I actually want to make her body shape real before I start masking out uh, the stool. So I just take my marquee tool, which is up here in the corner or the letter M on your keyboard. And we're just gonna highlight her body here and go command shift A. No, oh my God. You know those moments when you like, your brain just crosses over? Yes. <laughs> Alt control shift F. That just happened to me. I was like, I said the words and I was like, that's not the right one. <laughs> So if you ever do the wrong, the wrong uh, tool, it's totally fine because it happens to all of us. Filter, liquefy, control shift X. There we go, I'm gonna move you out of the way. So yeah, if that ever happens to you, oh my God, it happens to me all the time, it's fine. <laughs> so what I wanna do here is I wanna fill back in her body where the stool is pressing her spine in more than it should be because she has a back and a spine. It's just the material, the softness of the, the stool is just pushing into her back. Uh, so I'm just going to push her back out to where it was. And I just noticed there's this little bundle of fabric here around her tummy. And I kind of just found it distracting. So I'm just changing that. And if you want to change the size of your brush on your keyboard, it's the brackets. So brackets uh, left and right make it go up and down. And I love keyboard shortcuts. So uh, I'm going to talk about them a lot today. So that's just a quick liquefy job there. I'm gonna move you back up here. So here in our history, here and here. So we're we looking good so far. Looking good. You have fans in the in the chat too. <laughs> Rut row. You yes. have <laughs> people are giving shout outs to your tutorials. Um, and you have Mark saying deep breath. <laughs> um, two questions. Yeah, do you want to do you want to go for questions for a second? Yeah, let's hear it. Um, these are both technology related, so I'm going to mm -hmm. ask them together. Mark asks if you can if you use the Wacom in pen or mouse mode. He feels the pen mode is too quick. And then Hasitha is asking, do you prefer wired or Bluetooth for your Wacom Intuos? Awesome, yeah, those are super good questions. So I keep it in pen mode, it's just what I'm used to. Um, I like it that way. But if mouse mode works better for you, then that's that. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to that. It's whatever works best for you. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what I have there. Um, if it is too fast for you, for sure take it slow. Uh, I do tell people when they're first getting into to using Wacom devices and they've never used them before, don't get the super expensive one right off the hop, get the cheaper one because they're not quite as sensitive and it's a little bit easier to learn on. And if you're trying to learn on it, do about 30 minutes a day of browsing the internet with it. You don't necessarily have to use it in Photoshop right away, but use it for like browsing Facebook, for going through Google, all that kind of stuff. It's just going to start building up that muscle memory and then it's not going to be as frustrating for you. And then once you spent a couple of years on like the, the cheaper tablets, the ones that are not as sensitive, then upgrade, spend the good money, and then you're really gonna understand and appreciate the sensitivity that's in the higher end models. And as far as uh, Bluetooth or wired, I keep mine wired just because um, it's habit. I'm, I'm old. <laughs> I know the generation behind me is like wireless everything and I'm just not that person. So I do keep mine wired in. Um, but the Bluetooth works great. I've used it before. Um, and you can plug it into another power source if you need to, but yeah, that's just a habit. I plug everything in. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go to this little flaggage pan and we're going to make a layer mask. So I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to make sure that I have my layer mask layer selected. So we can click here and accidentally be painting, um, see if we go to our brush tool first, B. 
And I can be accidentally painting color and go, oh my God, what's going on? Well, it's because I've selected my layer instead of my layer mask. And so right now I have a white brush with a white mask, which means if I paint, nothing's gonna happen. So I want to paint black and I wanna have a slightly zoomed in look here. So I'm just taking a look and seeing these edges here and I'm making my brush kind of a hardness that'll match this. Now there are quick mask tools that you can use for this. Uh, again, this just goes back to me being a little bit old school. I like doing everything by hand. Uh, I like the control that it gives me. I like that it makes me more precise and it makes me more aware of what's going on in the image itself. And so basically all that's happening right now is we are revealing the blank image behind in a very specific spot. So I'm just gonna zoom in here, make my brush a little bit smaller, which is gonna make those soft edges a little bit harder. And I'm just painting in some of this texture here because the belt here does have a little bit of material and so I don't want it to completely go away. And we're just gonna come along here, zoom this in. Okay. Get rid of that. And so now this is gonna happen a lot. So I thought about changing the outfit on this image uh, but then I was like, this is going to happen to you. So sometimes fabric is just going to be where you don't need it to be. And so what I'm doing in this case is I'm just making it as if it's part of this little black stripe here. This black stripe is technically part like of a lack of light from the chair because the black stools absorbs all the light. And so it creates a shadow here on the skin. But I was like, well, if I just make this look like it's part of the dress, <laughs> No one's gonna notice, like unless I print this thing massive, which um, this one I probably won't, but I mean, I like it. So it just looks like there, if we zoom all the way out, once my computer's done having a fit. <laughs> there we go. It just looks like it's part of the dress, right? So all it is is that it just has to be not distracting. That's it. So we're just gonna zoom in here again. So zooming in on your keyboard, um, is control plus or minus. Computer's having a fit today. <laughs> it is a webinar. There we go. All right, so I'm just going to continue masking out this stool here. And I could go all into like textured brushes and all that kind of stuff, but that will be for a more advanced class in the future. We do have a brush question on this on this part of the process. Photo yep, maker says, is Renee using a soft brush, hard brush, or airbrush on relatively hard setting to mask the stool? Yeah, so what I'm doing is I'm changing the uh, hardness of the edges of the brush as I'm working. So I have my keyboard remapped so that I can change the hardness and softness of the brush on the fly. So normally you'd be changing your hardness here and your size here. Uh, and so what I've done and I, is I have reprogrammed my keyboard in the Photoshop settings so that I can do that a lot quicker without having to go across the screen. Because I find mousing is too slow. It's one of my main complaints with the latest Windows versions um, is that uh, I have to do a lot of mousing and it takes forever. And again, I come from like old school computer days where keyboarding was king. So that's kind of where I like it to be. Uh, and it's I'm not on airbrush settings or anything. These are just because this is an intro class. I have everything on the basic, most basic of modes. Uh, it doesn't really matter. So in this case here, I'm just masking these with the pattern of the grass. So I'm just following the direction of where the grass is because there's no shadow here from her. And so the dappled light where the stool would be, I'm just trying to fake it and have it be not distracting. That's all. So, because when we zoom out here, we just get rid of some of that there. It just, I just don't want it to be obvious, right? I want people to notice her. I don't really want people to notice, you know, the, oh, there's this gigantic blob of soft edge grass strands. So yeah, I'm just changing the brush size, changing um, the, size, the softness of it, just so that there's a little more randomization. Clear as mud? 
the brush, the brush topic is there are more questions on brushes. Do you want yeah. to take them now? A hundred percent. Yeah. Brushes are amazing <laughs> and so complicated. There's so much you can do with them. They're my favorite thing ever. So yeah, let's hear it. Okay. So, um, let's see, I'm trying to group them a little bit. Um, is the brush that you are using a specific type of brush? So photo maker is saying what type of brush, not the settings. It's just the general brushes right at the top. Okay. Soft and round, hard brush. Yeah, it is like as basic as basic gets. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you can use, I mean, you can use custom brushes. You can use, uh, there's these really great uh, legacy brushes that were in earlier versions of Photoshop that I love. Uh, and so if you want to find them, uh, legacy brushes. So if you get, liked using textured brushes and the updates in Photoshop hid them from you, just this little uh, gear here and you can load up your legacy brushes right there. So then you're going to see them at the end of your list. But for now, I'm literally sticking to like general brushes. Cool. Yeah. Um, Rhea is asking, does Renee use a variety of different brushes? She says, Rhea says, I typically just use a basic brush and often wonder how much I'm limiting myself. Yeah, so we could do an entire webinar on brushes that could last six hours. Brushes are amazing. <laughs> um, and there's so many places to get free ones. There's so many places to buy them or even make your own. Uh, the, your photo manipulations and your photo editing will get a lot more fun once you start understanding how uh, diverse textured brushes can be. So one of my favorite brushes, uh, and it is in the legacy brushes. Um, let me see here. Do, 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 do. We just got to find it. Uh, legacy brushes, where are we? So I really don't like this new brush panel at all. Uh, it's very frustrating. I miss being able to see all of them in one spot. <laughs> so we just have to scroll forever and ever and ever and ever. Uh, but there is a brush and it's called Splatter 59. And I talk about it all the time because I use it. There we go. Splatter. Uh, these are some of my favorite brushes to use because what they have are these super great textures and I use them for masking out stuff all the time. So Splatter 59 is my favorite. That's not Splatter, that's Smudge. There we go. Chalk. So I'm just going to create a new blank layer here. And so the reason why I love it is it has these great textures. And so when I'm masking out, especially grass and stuff like this, I love using this brush. I love using it for hair. I love it for masking out lace. Uh, it's, it's like one of the most diverse brushes that Photoshop has ever come up with. And it comes standard with the program. Uh, and it has come with the program for many, many, many versions. So um, the splatter brushes are great. So if you want to play, if, if you don't want to spend money on brushes, uh, just load the legacy brushes, this little wheel here, and legacy brushes. And uh, you'll just play with those and see what you think and if it's making you better, if you like the changes that it's making, or if you're not liking it. I mean, again, this is this is digital art. I mean, there isn't really, in my opinion, a right or wrong way to do it. It's just ways that make sense to you and ways that don't. So, Renee, I'm checking on our Facebook crew, and it looks like they missed um let's see can you use a quick mask first yep. and go in to manually adjust the finer details of the mask that's from jen on facebook yeah that's another way that you can do it um again i just really like doing everything by hand but the quick mask tool does work well so quick masking what she's talking about let's zoom in here my poor computer i don't know what's wrong with it i just replaced the hard drive and it's a little bit funky since then there we go. All right, so quick masking, what she's talking about then is we would go here to this tool. Uh, we would select our layer, right? We're not gonna be working on the mask. We're gonna select our layer. We're gonna click the quick mask tool here and let's say we wanna select the dress. And in this case, that it works really well because the dress is this really bright white and the grass all around it is green. And so you can make a pretty good selection. And if you go over, you just hold Alt, and then you just go uh, select and mask. And so then there's like all these settings and everything here that you can do. So yeah, quick mask tool, uh, it works really well and it's getting better and better all the time. Uh, I still prefer, I still find I can get better results doing it by hand, uh, but that's because 
I've been doing it for a few too many years. Um, so yeah, if you like using Quick Mass Tool, for sure, just make sure that uh, Quick Mass Tool can give you, it, what it'll do is it'll give you the same kind of transition on all the edges. So this is my main beef with Quick Mask. So in this case here, uh, the transitions on everything between the edges aren't always the same because some parts of her are more stable than others, right? So her head, these pixel transitions are uh, quite quick. And then of course, the more of her body that was moving because of this dress that we were throwing around, the edges are softer. So when you use a quick mask tool, when you say feather, you're gonna say, you know, feather three pixels or whatever, it's gonna feather three pixels all around all of the edges. Uh, but whereas here around her mouth, a three, a three pixel feather wouldn't really necessarily make sense. And some of these areas further out here where the dress is moving quite far and quite fast, maybe we need like a five pixel blend, right? And so that's why I just like doing it manually. Um, but again, there's no really right or wrong reason, to, right or wrong way to do it. How are we doing there, lady? You have so many questions, Renee. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we get to just spend time on the grass right now. Do you mm -hmm. want to keep working or do you want me to ask you? Um, yeah, well, what I can do is I'm just going to get rid of this little flag here, this little thing. So I'm just going to go to my stamp tool. And if you were doing like a really big complicated edit, then maybe the stamp tool wouldn't be the right tool to use. Uh, but in this case, it's just such a small little spot. I'm just going to sample. So I'm holding alt click and I'm just going to get rid of that little red thing and it was distracting. So um, if you were doing major, major compositing, you would want to do that on its own blank layer. But in this case, if you're just getting into it, a quick stamp to get rid of something small like that, you don't need, it doesn't have to be on its own layer. Um, but from here, I mean, we can just go into uh, doing some color adjustments or we can answer questions. I mean, I, this is set up to be, um, you know, not super complicated, so we can answer questions the whole way through. I think that Michelle has a really good question and it That's ties right. into um, the layer masking too, which people wanted to a slower version of that just to kind of see it again. I think some people- I can just do like, it again. Okay. So yeah. let me ask you Michelle's question too, because I think okay. it's, they're, they're, of the same. Um, Michelle says, how do you fix it when your landscape shot and your model shot don't match up anymore because of wind or lighting? Is there an easy fix or is it just more work? It's just more work. <laughs> yeah, that sucks. Uh, that happens sometimes and it's just more work. Uh, there's no super quick fix to that. I mean, you'd have to, you'd have to see the image uh, exactly what's going on. That's why tripods are so important. Uh, because then what you do is whenever you're doing something where you're going to be compositing on location, make sure you have a photograph with nothing in it. So after you're done posing everyone, take a picture when no one is in the shot. And so in this case, like it looks like everything moves just because it was so windy. <laughs> the, the grass is just going everywhere. So even masking out this stool, it's kind of approximate. Um, it's a lot easier when it's not a windy day. Uh, but make sure you have your blank slate so that once you start compositing in the pieces, you know, parts of the dress, parts of the hair, et cetera, um, that you have, you're compositing it onto a blank slate here so that it just, it's just going to be easier for you, but it does suck. <laughs> it does take time. How are we doing there, Melissa? Good. Um... Do, you want me to, do you want me to go through a masking out this stool one more time? Um, will you just show what layer masking is one more time with Oh yeah, the... for sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just making two layers. And let's see here. Actually, I'm going to pick a different color other than black because layer masking is black and white. So let's make red. Those are two garish colors. Okay, so right now uh, I have my blue cake. So let's pretend that layer masking is a cake. So the blue layer is the cake itself, the fluffy stuff with all the, the sugar and the chemicals and the carcinogens. And then the red, we're going to put red icing on a blue cake. So the other side of the sugar and the carcinogens, but the tastier stuff that you put like the milk and cream into. So let's say we put too much icing on the cake and we want, we have somebody at our, at our uh, event who doesn't want any icing on their cake. And so we go, okay, 
no problem. We're going to put a layer mask on. So that's this little square and the circle on the inside, little flag of Japan looking thing. And I'm going to go to my brush tool, which is the letter B on the keyboard. So if I look here, I have a white mask. And right now I'm painting with a white brush. So if I paint, we're not going to see anything. Now, if I have black, which layer masking works on a, on a black and white scale, we paint black on our white layer mask. And now all of a sudden we can see the blue cake underneath the red icing. So if I click here, we can see exactly what our layer mask looks like. <clears throat> so the other reason why would we do this? Why wouldn't we just use the eraser tool? Because if we make a mistake and we go, oh my God, we took off too much icing. I'm going to invert my brush, which on the keyboard is the letter X. I'm going to paint white and I can start painting back in areas that I put, I scraped off too much icing. So that's essentially how layer masking works is it's just putting stuff on and scraping stuff off so that you can see stuff underneath or you can see stuff on top. And that's exactly what we're doing here with the stool. So the nice thing here is I can hide, I can disable the layer mask so that I can see the stool that's underneath it. And then I can enable the layer mask just by clicking on it again. And what it does is it shows the blank slate image underneath. Because otherwise, the only other way to get rid of this would be clone stamping. And that takes forever. It sucks. It's not a good use of your time. It's so much easier just to take two images, one with the subject in there and one with the subject without, and then just erase the area that you need to erase. Cotter is asking, is it the same process, is layer masking the same process um, when we want a different background, a background other than the original? Yep, yep, same thing, exactly the same thing. Yeah, it's just one thing on top of another and you're just hiding or, or showing something else. So I have um, a ton of images uh, that if we have time, which I don't know if we will, um, but we can probably just do another webinar in the future. Uh, that shows a more complicated version of this. Or uh, if you want to go to my YouTube channel, I have some time lapses there. Um, my YouTube channel, I don't use it very often, if I'm honest, but if you search Renee Robin uh, YouTube channel, you'll, you'll see it pop up. Uh, and there it's, I'm taking photographs of people in the studio, and then I'm putting them onto another background, and it's the same process. So I have my subject, and I have my background, and I'm basically either masking out the person so that the person shows through to the background or the other way around. All right. Yeah, this is basically like if you want to get into compositing, you got to master masking and it's it sounds super complicated. But once you figure it out, it's binary it's ones and zeros. It's not so bad. So there's just a lot of different techniques uh, to get different surfaces to work. OK, um, we have a couple of questions about keyboard shortcuts. Yeah. Um, yep. How do you program them <laughs> for and in Photoshop? And then somebody else asked how you do it in a Wacom tablet. Right, so uh, the Wacom tablet, I only have the Wacom, the Wacom one with me here today, so it doesn't have any buttons, uh, which I kind of like. Uh, but so the tablets themselves, um, they, are, they have all the buttons on the side that are completely programmable. So you're just gonna go into your Wacom settings and you're gonna pull up, uh, I don't know if it's gonna work without the Intuos plugged in. Let me see, Wacom tablet properties. This is for the one that we have plugged in right now. So, uh, so typically what you're gonna do is, are there a bunch of buttons that you, like actions that you do all the time? So brush tool, um, smudge tool, whatever, whatever they are that you use all the time, stamp tool. What you can do is you can program them into the side of your tablet and you can just push those buttons instead of having to go to the keyboard. Um, and so it's just, it makes everything faster in the long run, right? Because if you're saving yourself you know, 0.3 or half a second now, over the course of 10 years, that's hours and days gone that have saved you uh, in time. And so, it's, and again, if you're billing yourself hourly um, or by the job, the faster you can get it done, the better. Uh, so, but in Photoshop, let me see here, I haven't done this in a while. So we're gonna go to edit and then keyboard shortcuts. And so here is the gigantic list of keyboard shortcuts. So if you actually aren't sure what your keyboard shortcuts are, this is a great way to learn. Um, this actually, when I was first getting into Photoshop, is how I taught myself the program, is I printed off 
the entire list of keyboard shortcuts that were available for the program and then I memorized them. <laughs> but uh, some of them uh, don't always make sense. So when I re reprogram my keyboard, I make sure that all the shortcuts that I use all the time are on the left side of the keyboard. So I'm not having to cross across the keyboard itself. So everything is uh, Q, W, E, R, uh, A, S, D, F, Z, X, C, V, basically. The ones that I use the absolute most are those shortcuts. So the V tool, uh, that's moved, that's, that I didn't have to change, that's just standard with it. Um, I don't really use the lasso tools very often, so I didn't bother reprogramming that. That stays L because it's just not a tool that I use very often. Uh, crop, I've, again, stayed the same. Uh, eyedropper tool, that's again another tool that I don't use super, super often. Uh, B um, is all the brushes, so mixer, brush, pencil tool, everything. And if you want to switch through, what those uh, buttons are, you just hold shift and then the letter that you wanna rotate through. So you can actually set up a bunch of uh, tools on one letter if you want to, and then just like rotate through them. But sometimes that can be more, more work than it's worth. But yeah, so basically go in here and uh, you know figure out which ones uh, that you wanna change, if you wanna change any, or if you just wanna memorize them, uh, this will make your life a lot faster in Photoshop. How's that, Melissa? Good. You have people asking questions and you have people saying, keep working. <laughs> Do you want to, um, can yeah, you keep can, working? 100%. And, yeah. Okay. And maybe you can talk about how you get your ideas. We do have that question. Uh, Stefan says, how do you get your ideas? Okay. Yeah. So my, my idea is uh, last minute panic is pretty good. <laughs> If I have a gig coming up and I have to think of something, uh, last minute panic serves me quite well, unfortunately. Um, and uh, dreaming, actually, I uh, started prioritizing sleep a lot more and uh, that's made a huge difference in my creative process, reading a lot, uh, studying concept art books, um, video games, books. Yeah, there's tons of ways to get inspiration. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna walk you guys through a non-destructive way to do color grading and we'll continue talking about inspiration here while we go. So there's this little half circle down here, this little circle cut in half, and this is like, I call it the Bible of non-destructive retouching. So this means that no matter what, I can change my mind. Uh, and when you're first getting out, this is a great way, because a lot of people, when they first get into color grading, they're like, oh, I'm gonna go image adjustments, and then I'm gonna go hue saturation. And what this is gonna do, and you'll see in a second, if I like tweak this, because it's affecting directly on the layer and we have this layer masked, all of a sudden this area that we masked out isn't changing color with it. So I don't want to do that. That also means that I'm committing to these things. And then when it comes to image making, I have commitment issues big time. So I'm constantly changing my mind. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here, this little half circle, I'm going to go to hue saturation. And now this is going to affect everything because this is a layer on its own on top of my image. And let's say just, for kicks and grins, uh, I like the idea that the grass looks purple. So I'm gonna paint black. I don't like the idea that the grass looks purple. I think it looks ridiculous, but <laughs> just to kind of like quickly show what I'm talking about when it comes to layer masking, and this is the worst mask job ever, but bear with me. So let's pretend that I liked this and I was like, yep, this is what I want. I want purple grass, um, you know, this is how I would do that because this is an adjustment layer and it comes with its own layer mask. And this also means that I can continue to change the colors later. I can change the saturation if I want to. I can change the lightness of it. Um, the lightness does affect saturation obviously as well. So if you're playing with your lightness levels, zero, if you're playing with your lightness levels, uh, you're gonna have to play with your saturation as well. Uh, but this is a really, really fun way and easy way to do color editing. Now, I don't necessarily, let's say this is like, I came to my senses um, and I put down that bottle of wine and I was like, actually, that was a terrible idea. So I'm just going to delete this and we're going to reset. Because it's its own layer and its own layer mask, we can just delete the layer. It's fine. It doesn't affect any of the other, part, uh, any of the other parts of the image. So I'm going to go here hue saturation. And so this is the master. And I'm like, you know, I fall is coming. I'm one of those jerks. I'm one of those people who just loves fall. 
Uh, I'm not a big summer person. So uh, I love that it's fall. And so I want to make this image to have fall colors. And I do this a lot, especially my early work is full of this, but still now I want to shoot on location. I do this all the time. So I go from master and I go, oh, I want to change the greens in this image. And I look at this image and all the grass actually looks green. Now, if I push this slider, it doesn't really change very much. Very, very, very little. And that's because this is being, all of this here, my computer is interpreting, interpreting as yellow, not green. And the nice thing is that her skin has yellow in it, but the skin is mostly being interpreted as red in this case. Now, I'm just going to push this just a little bit. Because if I push it too far, you're going to see like what's happening in her foot here. The foot is starting to go red, right? And yes, I could mask that if I want to, but this is the interest of doing the least amount of work possible while still making a cool image. So I'm just going to drop that just a tiny little bit. And now I can turn on and off this layer and say, do I like this change? Do I not like this change? And this is how we can edit color independently. And it's one of my favorite ways to manipulate images. And because I selected the yellow layer, and it's just changing some of these colors just a little bit. I mean, I can drop the saturation a little bit more if I want to. Um, I can increase the saturation. Probably going to leave it at zero, though. Lightness, nah, don't really want to play with that either. Yeah, so just adjusting the hue on the yellow channel makes this nice difference in this image. And now all of a sudden, it feels more harmonious to look at. Uh, another way that we can manipulate color really easily is we can go to color balance. And we can stack. The cool thing is that we can stack and stack and stack to infinity to manipulate color in Photoshop. So here, this, what this does is we have shadows, midtones, and highlights. So midtones are basically everything that's middle toned in this image. So this is my magenta to greens, cyans and reds. And this is only affecting the midtones, which there's a ton of in this image. And then this is blues and yellows. So in this case, what I want to do is I want to do a thing called split toning. And it's a really easy, simple, pretty way to make pleasing color in your shots. So in this case here, I'm doing, I'm adding some cyan to my highlights. I could try reds, but I find what's going to happen here is I'm going to get just too much red in the shot. So I'm going to add cyans to the highlights. And then I'm going to go to my shadows and I'm just going to go to the opposite. I'm just going to add a little bit of red to the shadows. And this creates this kind of like 1970s film color grade um, that I find quite pleasing for whatever reason. When I was first got into photo editing and photo making, I did a lot of blues and magentas uh, and greens and magentas. And these days, for whatever reason, cyans and reds are totally up my alley. So uh, when you get into this, you're going to realize that color manipulation, your taste changes over time as well. Now, the fun thing also on top of that, because this is non-destructive editing, is I can turn off the hue saturation layer underneath and I can see what this color balance layer does without the hue saturation adjustment under it. So that's why this is kind of like, you know, mixing up a cake essentially. We're making a bunch of ingredients and going, do these ingredients look good or taste good together or do they not? And for me, I kind of love this stuff. And there's this other great trick here that I use all the time for color creating. Uh, it's the color lookup uh, panel. And I use this as soon as I found out about it and I still use it to this day. Um, and you can just basically like tap through all these different ways to edit color. So if we look at this and we go, oh, I really like this, it's a terrible choice, but let's pretend we really like it, but it's too strong we can just turn down the opacity of that layer. And now we can say, okay, if we turn off these two, does it look good? Does it look better with just this one or this one? I can turn this on and off and see if the adjustment I made is something that I like. And we can basically turn this down to almost nothing. So in this case, it's almost like adding a little bit of salt to your meal. You know, was it a good choice? Is it a bad choice? Did you add too much? Did you add too little? And yeah, that's essentially like the, the fastest way that I like to do color grading, especially for images that are shot on location, is I love using hue saturation, color balance, and color lookup tools. And there's tons of them. Oh my god, there's so many. So if we turn this up all the way up, 
Um, and these these come, you can buy color lookup tables if you want, but these come straight in Photoshop. They're not, you know, this is really cute. I like this blue as well, it's too strong. Let's turn it down a little bit. And on and off. But yeah, that's essentially like the fastest way that I like to do color grading and a really, really easy way to make someone float in Photoshop. <laughs> a little bit of layer masking, hue saturation and color balance. Oh, are we done? This basically is like the fastest way to do it, yeah. <laughs> wow, okay. Are you ready for questions? Yeah, let's do it. That's why I kind of like grabbed this up a little quick because we have a ton of questions and I'd love to be able to answer, answer as many as possible, so. Oh, wow, okay. But yeah, so like, yeah, we're basically going from that image that image. Nice. Okay. Um, so there's image specific questions and broader questions. I'll start with a broad question. Let's hear it. This is from Miguel. With Lightroom now having many of the functions that Photoshop has, what do you always do in Photoshop and what can you take care of in Lightroom? Uh, so I actually don't use Lightroom at all. I don't have the program on my computer, but you can do tons and tons of color grading all in, in Lightroom. So the one thing that I recommend, especially if you're getting into layer masking, is try to get all of your layer masking handled first. So in this case, uh, let's just go here. So let's just pretend that these two images were your Lightroom exports. So these are the raw files. Um, unless you copy the color grading exactly, which you can do in Lightroom, you can copy and paste your settings across. Make sure that these two images are shot or are edited with the exact same colors and then bring them into Photoshop, do all your masking, br like bring it all together and you can export it as a TIFF or as a PSD file. So as long as it's under two gigs, you can export it and it will pop back into Lightroom and then you can continue color grading. So yeah, there's, there's no reason uh, why you can't do that. Just the only thing you can't do is masking, so. Um, Antoine is noticing the black color near the model's back. Um, yeah. Will you work on the black color? Just curious. Uh, there is a bunch of ways that I could fix it. They're a little more advanced than what we had planned on coloring today, like planned on doing today. Um, so one of the things that we can do is we can create a soft light layer. And this is one of many, like there are more effective ways to do this than I am showing you guys, but it's just, it's for a more advanced day. I don't want to confuse anybody, but we can do a soft light layer. Uh, and then we can sample a color of the skin here and we can kind of paint in. So that's like, it's obviously too saturated. Let's see here. I probably could mask a little bit more out of her back. Let's see here. So this is a nice thing about everything being non-destructive. Oops. And let's make that edge a little harder. So we can do something that's called dodge and burning to kind of handle this, but it's also quite dark. Uh, the other way that I would handle this is uh, frequency separation, which has a lot of bad rap on the internet, but for fixing stuff like this, it does make a big difference. But even just having this soft light layer here, let's pick a different color and try to blend it. 100% flow and opacity is too strong also, so let's pull that down. And I'm just sampling colors that are close to the areas. And I could probably wrap around some of these. So I'm just hitting uh, the Alt tab, make that soft. And I'm just wrapping around some of this light. So yeah, there's, you're still gonna have a little bit of that shadow there, but if we turn this on and off, See, it's sample a little bit more here. And then probably just mask out more of that dark shadow. My computer's pitching a fit. So now what's happening is I'm getting a little bit of a soft edge, which I don't want because her back is not transparent. 
So yeah, it's not perfect, but again, like I said, the, the technique that I would like to use to get rid of that uh, is definitely more advanced than what people have signed up for for today. So uh, if you go onto YouTube, you can search frequency separation because what that does is it separates the color from the texture. And I would basically uh, just push that color back over that shadowed area. So, but again, a little more complicated than what we have signed up for today. Naomi is asking, how often do you use the pen tool for masking? I never do, <laughs> but I have a lot of friends who swear by it and they use it all day, every day. Uh, and it's an amazing tool and uh, I just never got into it. <laughs> so uh, it's great though. It's uh, especially if you're dealing with hard edge surfaces. So a lot of my friends are automotive photographers and they live and die by the pen tool. They love it. Uh, and so, yeah, an amazing tool. It's just one that I never really got into. Um, photo maker is asking, is there a quick way to preview the color effects of the LUTs, the lookup tables without having to apply them? Could you just scroll down a list? Yeah. So it is going, it's not necessarily applying to the image because it's just, it's just a layer on top, right? So you just open, you just create this layer. I'll just delete that. So we're just going to go here and go to the color lookup. So this little half circle color lookup. And it's not really applying to the image because none of this is stuck to it. So you just tap down on the keyboard. Although I do believe if you're a Mac user, you have to open it up and then click each one. I'm not sure. I'm a PC user. So um, we can just like tap through and just preview it and see what they all look like here. There's no list of where how to see them all simultaneously, though. You just kind of have to tap through them all. Okay, next question. Yeah, sorry. I don't know if that was a great answer for it, but it's like, yeah, that's kind of, <laughs> that's how you do it. And if you don't like any of them, you just delete the layer. So if you don't like that, you just hit the delete on your keyboard and it's gone. Um, photo maker's response is, I haven't found a way to mouse over and see the effect, even if it's not applied. So it sounds like that's not a way. Might be a Mac user. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, because you just, so long as it's a little half circle here and you go color lookup tables, if you're going image uh, adjustments, color lookup tables, uh, then it's going to apply directly to the image. But you have to, as long as you go through this little half circle here on color lookup, it's going to be its own layer. And so then you can like turn this on and off. But yeah, if you are, let's pretend here. Oops. If we went image adjustments, and then color lookup table on this, uh, it will apply directly to it and there is no way to preview, which is the problem. So yeah, so long as you have this half circle here, and unless it also could be if you're using an older version of Photoshop, which I'm not really sure which version you're using, uh, maybe that's a, a problem there as well. I'm not sure, so. Um, Michelle is saying, is asking, do you usually keep your laptop, desktop, next to the tablet to work? Or do you only use a separate keyboard and just work on the tablet? Yeah, so I have a laptop and so I use the laptop keyboard. So that's what my setup is. Um, but you can use an external laptop if you want, if you wanna put it on your lap or if you wanna sit further away, if you have like a large external monitor, you can totally do that. So, I mean, there's also even uh, keyboard, uh, like small keyboards now that are totally pro programmable. The gamers use them all the time. And you can get one of those and just like set it to the side and just have that with the with the with the Cintiq or the Wacom one and you'd be fine too. So Brianna wants to know, do you like to work to music? And I bet she would also say, what music do you like? <laughs> I constantly I only work to music. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are like, oh, I work to movies and podcasts and stuff. I can't do it. I have to I have to have only have music and music that I've heard a lot. I have to listen to the same few playlists over and over and over again, which is super frustrating for anyone who's stuck living with me. <laughs> you don't get songs caught in your head while you're doing it? It's better if I do, actually. I find I work better if I can shut down the chatterbox brain. <laughs> That's just like yammering on all day long. So as long as I can shut it up and occupy it with like an earworm of a song or a playlist, uh, then I do better work. <laughs> so, yeah. So is the... Is the Chatterbox version telling you, I mean, is it like your editor or is it? No, it's distractive. It's, oh. it's like, 
oh my God, we haven't done the dishes. No, the laundry is still done. And oh my God, did you park in the right spot? Are you going to get a parking ticket? And I'm like, shut up. Everything's fine. <laughs> it's not my editor at all. It's super annoying. <laughs> I need, I need your playlist, Renee. I feel like I just have that all the time. So um, I listen to the same music over and over and over and over again. Cause then just like that part of my brain just like focuses in on that. And then I, the rest of me can pay attention to the work. All right. So Dion has, I think a big question, although maybe it's not a big question. How, how difficult would it be to change background for this model? Could you demonstrate it? Oh man, this would suck. Uh, this would be terrible to cut her out and put her into something else. It would be totally garbage. Now, the reason why this would be so hard is because we have all these grass blades that are growing up in front of her. Uh, that's in her hair, that's on her hands. And then the lace behind her is semi-transparent and it's showing uh, this background through. So if I was going to mask her out, I would absolutely not photograph her in this environment at all. <laughs> if I had to photograph her outside, I would try to get her high enough so that she was against the sky, preferably like a neutral looking sky. Uh, this would be a nightmare and I would never do it. <laughs> So when I was younger, when I was first getting into it, I was cutting out these kinds of things all the time and I was finding exactly that problem. Um, so it would maybe work if you were putting her into a similar type of background here, but still just like masking out all of these blades of grass that are different textures and different levels of bokeh and everything, it would suck. It would be a nightmare. So uh, don't do that to yourself. <laughs> um. So let's do one more, maybe two more questions. How's yeah, that? Sure. I'm good, man. I got, I'm here for like, I got time. <laughs> okay. Uh, David wants to know how much Photoshop pre-planning do you do prior to shooting? Uh, the more Photoshop pre-planning you do prior to shooting, the better. Uh, but sometimes I don't do enough. <laughs> so the more you can pre-plan what you have in mind before you go out and shoot, the easier it's going to be to get exactly what you want. Uh, this one here, we had planned to shoot this for like three weeks. And then the one day that we had able to go out every, like the weather had been perfect for weeks. And then all of a sudden the one day that we wanted to go out, uh, obviously it was bright blue sky and 80 kilometer an hour winds and it wasn't anything that we wanted. So uh, as much as you can plan pre-plan, plan for backup plans as well. So when we got out there and we realized like how bad it was, we were like, okay, we have to find a grove of trees that's gonna kind of protect the wind. Um, you know, so plan for backups and plan for plan B, plan C, plan D, just in case. Okay. Um, let me see. There was a couple good. Oh, uh, Ria says, do you find color inconsistency between your Photoshop creations when you view them on different devices? hundred percent. Yeah, of course. That's, uh, that's the world that we live in now. Everyone has a different phone, everyone has a different computer, everyone has a different laptop. And so everything looks different on a bunch of different devices. So what I do is I have a bunch of different screens that I look at my work on. So I have a calibrated screen that's for printing. So my screen is calibrated that what I see on the screen is what it's gonna look like printed. Then I have my laptop screen, which is an OLED screen. So it sees further into the red spectrum than the other screens that I have. Uh, which is super frustrating sometimes, but also people who are gamers now, like that's how they're going to be viewing my work. The Wicom One calibrates differently again. My phone, my iPad, like all this stuff, like they all, they all see things differently because there's different levels of technology in all of them. And so I just do a quick check of the file on all these devices and go like, do it like, is it okay? Like, is it good enough, right? Because the clients that I care about the most are the ones who are printing the work. Uh, those are the ones that I can control, especially uh, if it's going to be printed large, I really want to be aware that what I'm seeing is what I'm going to get printed. But when it goes online, man, it's going to be seen on everything. And so you just kind of got to prepare yourself as best you can and make the work look as good as you can get it. And then just accept that everyone's going to see something different. Okay. Last question is going to be from Ginkgo. How did you learn Photoshop? And most importantly, any tips for beginners? Okay, so how did I learn Photoshop? Uh, I went into, so now to be fair, and I mentioned this earlier, I taught myself Photoshop on Photoshop 7. So that was almost 20 years ago, not CS7, but Photoshop 7. Uh, and before that I had Photoshop version five, which uh, I didn't have it very long, seven came out. And so I hopped on that train. 
But one of the ways that I taught myself was I went to edit and then I learned the keyboard shortcuts. So I just printed off like a huge list of the keyboard shortcuts and was just like, what does it do? Um, but now there's so many resources out there for you. Uh, when I was teaching myself, there was no YouTube, there was no anything. <laughs> so it was just like, get the program, figure it out. Uh, you don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to suffer yourself that way. So, I mean, people say like a lot of bad things about the school of YouTube, but man, there's so much education out there that's either free or that you can pay for, you can take courses. Uh, you gotta figure out a little bit of the direction of what kind of editing you want to learn. So basically look at a bunch of artwork out there and be like, okay, what do I like? You know, is it uh, on location photography? Is it illustration? Is it 3D, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so figure out a direction instead of just being like this big cloud of gray, right? So figure a direction and go, okay, I want to spend the next month learning about brushes. What do brushes do, right? And then just go find, search YouTube, search whatever uh, Udemy, um, I don't even know if lynda.com is even still around, but find a bunch of these websites and just get some courses and, you know, figure out the little tiny tools at a time. Like this is a huge program. It's super complicated, uh, but it doesn't have to be right. So, I mean, just today, like super easy, uh, we can take an image just like this and just a few simple, simple steps. So you can have a really nice color grade and there's 10,000 different ways to get to this color grade that I showed you today. So there's, the beautiful part and the frustrating part about Photoshop is that there's a thousand different ways to do the same thing. The good thing though, is that there's a thousand different ways to do the same thing, which means you can find the way that makes the most sense to you, right? So there's a way to teach yourself Photoshop and to learn the program that works for the way that your head is wired. And you know, there's other people who are going to have techniques that are going to show you in like two to five years. And you're going to be like, what? That like changes everything. Uh, so yeah, just start small and don't get discouraged. You just got to do it, man. It's just time in. You'll be all right. <laughs> all right, Renee. Well, we will have you back for another webinar, I promise. Yeah, that'd be fun. Cool. All right. Thank you, Renee. I'm going Thank to- Thank you everyone for watching. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. I super yeah. appreciate it. As always, you are a treat to talk to. <laughs> And you certainly had your, your fans here. You had a lot of people saying that um, they learned Photoshop from you. Oh, dear. Yay. <laughs> I hope I didn't teach you bad habits. I've learned better ways. <laughs> All right. I'm going to share my screen again, and it will have a promo deal for Wacom One, which is the product that uh, Renee is using right now. Yeah, and I love it. Oh, my God. It's so awesome. All right. We'll sit here for a second and thank you so much, everybody. Tom, that's a wrap.